Good afternoon. Welcome to Agile Development and Lean Transformation, a practical guide with Scott Siderman. I'm Jessica Dang with Results Washington. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be your moderator today. Today, we have about 800 of you registered for this session, and we're so happy that you're here. I'm joined today by Emily Dahl, who will be, who will be providing ASL interpretation today. I want to say thank you to my teammates who are handling all the technology behind the scenes. I want to share a few things with you before we get started today. We know many of you are familiar with Zoom meetings, but there are some differences in Zoom webinar. The biggest difference is you won't be able to talk or have your video visible. This ensures all participants can focus on today's session. We want to draw your attention to the Zoom toolbar. Move your mouse and the toolbar will appear and you can see the icons for chat and Q&A. Chat is not available during the session. We will post the links to Scott's presentation though, and you can find it there. Um, and feel free to drop questions into Q&A at any time. We will have some Q&A time at the end. Since there are so many of you here, we won't be able to answer every question, but we hope to get to a few before the end of today's session. If you're having technical issues, please use the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to help you. You'll, next, you'll notice an icon for closed captioning. If you wish to see the captioning, click on that icon and select view full transcript. You can adjust your view to make the presentation or speaker larger by sliding the vertical bar uh, on your screen from left to right. Session materials are available on our website and the video from today will be available within a week. If we get disconnected or run into tech troubles, we will try to get the webinar back up in five minutes. If we're not able to, we will video record and then post it at a later time. Finally, at the end of the session, a survey will pop up. Please take time to complete the survey. It will provide the presenter and Results Washington uh, great real-time feedback. We're so fortunate to have Scott with us today. Say a few words to introduce Scott. For over 20 years, Scott has helped organizations transform performance. His approach is simple. Ask provocative questions while, while forging high-performing teams. Start by applying just in time to the banking industry. <clears throat> His career now includes process improvement, redesign, measurement, change management, and organizational design in banking, insurance, government, criminal justice, customer care, behavioral health, utilities, higher education, and healthcare. Scott is a certified Six Sigma Black Belt, manager of quality organizational excellence, pro side change management, and project management professional. Welcome, Scott. Oh, we can't thank hear you. There we go. Um, thank you and uh, hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I feel privileged to be able to talk to all of you. I'm not sure if you're all in the, in the Washington state area. I know with virtual, we could be anywhere. If you're on the East Coast, special shout out to you guys because uh, because I know that it's later there, it's about 6 p.m. So you're interrupting your dinner to, to be with us tonight. Let me share my screen so that we can actually uh, see my presentation. Give me one second. Hello. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about agile development, lean transformation, and how to make it practical, how to actually do things uh, that maybe your organization need. And our agenda for today, uh, and those are not typos, Jessica did ask me this a week ago. It is why is agile, why is lean, and what is lean transformation? And we're gonna get into details. The reason it's why is I think it's important that we all have a little conversation about or a little understanding of why these things developed or how these things developed before we talk about what they are and how to do them so that we can actually build on our common knowledge and, and have a context. But before we get into that, what I'd like to do is ask each of you through the poll that uh, one of my associates is gonna put, put up to answer four specific questions from your perspective. 
uh, and they're yes, no questions. So you're gonna get all four of them pop up as a QA and a on screen. You're gonna to need to scroll down to see them all. And the first one is I've been involved in a successful Big Bang project, something that delivered system and process change all at once. Uh, secondly, and I popped in the middle of my screen. Let's go. Uh, secondly, I've been involved with a successful agile development project. So you've been involved, you've seen it as a customer, as a developer, it doesn't really matter. Uh, second, I've been involved in a successful lean project. How many people on the call today have actually been involved in a project and seen it be successful? And lastly, how many people have been involved in a lean transformation? And we'll talk more about the differences between the last two as we go, but transformation really talks about an order of magnitude improvement rather than typical lean projects that are continuous improvement. So take some time, uh, answer the four questions. These will help me as as we work through the rest of the, the presentation. Great. Just taking some notes for later. Great. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And like I said, that will help us as we go. So let's start with why is Agile? Why is Agile? Where did Agile come from? Why did we even develop it? Why did developers get frustrated with the way things were? Well, the first thing that we find out is that early on in its inception, and I believe Agile started to become more prevalent uh, become prevalent rather in the 90s. Um, Waterfall, the big bang system delivery project where everything's delivered at once, um, prevailed at that point. Uh, it was large, it was cumbersome, it had lots of moving parts, it made project managers very, very profitable. Um, and it oftentimes took so long that it didn't yield the results fast enough for the businesses that were undertaking their projects. Um, and many believe that it was over-regulated by people who were not in the technological domains or, or didn't really understand what was going on there. Uh, at the same time as this is happening, many different, what they call lightweight versions of system development were happening. Um, I remember learning how to do a rapid application development project from a facilitator standpoint. And all these names may feel familiar to you. You may have seen some of them as you've been through your career. Um, and what actually started to happen a little bit later is it got, it, things got catalyzed with, um, with Agile. And some of the reasons why Agile got catalyzed and is the one that we hear about the most today we saw that waterfall projects would take too long and cost lots of money and oftentimes at the end delivered an outdated result. Um, customers started to become more demanding. That's us, by the way. Each and every one of us on this call is a customer of some sort of improvement project, some sort of a technology project. And to wait three years to get a new button on an interface seems like a long time. Um, technology became more pervasive. Everybody here, I'm gonna guess, carries some form of a personal communication device. Yeah, a cell phone. And um, we probably all use computers in one way, shape or form every day of our lives, not just for work. So we, found, we find that uh, technology is everywhere and it's becoming more and more important to our daily existence. There's always a need for more automation. In some respects, this is the Amazon effect. Uh, we got so comfortable using Amazon for everything that we started to do that we wanted more and more automation. Our cell phones are just one manifestation of that. And 
Because it became pervasive, it was really important that technology be updated in a real time or close to real time basis so that we wanted more and more functionality. Everybody remembers the day when Google first launched and on the front page, it said beta. Well, that beta mentality meant we're constantly pounding on it. We're constantly fixing it. We're constantly improving it. Um, and we want to do that in a, in a real time basis that uh, allows you to get more functionality as we go. And along the way, more tools started to get developed, more modular design tools started to get developed. So I can fix something over here while everything else is still stable. So out of this comes this thing called Agile. And I remember when I was starting at Microsoft back in 19, I'm sorry, 2006, um, it was the summer, I think it was probably June. It was a beautiful day in Seattle. I know we do have those once in a while. Um, it was a beautiful day. I'm sitting at lunch with someone I'd never met before in the development crew. And he's talking to me about Agile. Like it's the newest thing on the block. And um, he starts talking about these benefits. I'm not going to bore you by reading the slide, right? But it, it, it's really simple to do. It's done. It, he talks, starts talking about short sprints and scrums and things that made nothing to me as a non-developer because I am not a developer. And after him talking to me for about five or 10 minutes, I looked him in the eye and I said, I think you just re-engineered software development or as we would say today, leaned it out. And here's why. If you look at this slide, these are all lean concepts that live inside of Agile. Team-based, customer satisfaction driven, close daily cooperation of teams, business people and developers will separate uh, substitute um, process analysts for developers and you have a lean project. You know, face-to-face -face conversations, the idea of scrum stand-ups every morning, uh, sustainable development so that it makes a difference as we go. Sounds a lot like lean continuous improvement to me. So they stole our playbook before it was called lean, back when it was called process improvement. And lo and behold, what do we have here? We have a set of software development practices that are intend intended to improve effectiveness and efficiency. We wind up that requirements are evolutionary, discovered rather than defined. We find that, that it advocates adaptive planning. Yeah, but what happens in the real world is the destination moves on us because customer demand changes. And lastly, it encourages a flexible response. And if you think about lean on the other side of this, lean encourages the flexible response of being able to push this into the hands of employees on a day in and day out basis. That's not to say that Agile doesn't have a dark underbelly. And one of the things that I saw in the statistics, let me see if I pull this up again, sorry. Um, only 28% of you were actually, can actually said that you were in a successful agile development project. And there's a reason for that. I did my research. So the reasons is there are, there really are no holistic requirements. It's very chunky. And the end point is rarely, if ever, fully fleshed out and defined. It's kind of stumbled toward. The shortness of the development sprints might mean that we don't actually get everything we want to done in the time frame allotted. It's more time boxed than outcome oriented. We see a lot of tools and software, um, Kanban systems and, and Slack type tools that allow us to chat. And it's possible, just possible, that that is distracting us from actually getting the work done. Anecdotally, Agile improves the effectiveness. Practically and empirically, difficult to tell. There are no real studies out there. I went out and did a little bit of homework and I couldn't find anything that said this agile project yielded a substantive success, which is a little frustrating if you're in there. Uh, not to say that agile is not a valid pursuit, but I'm looking for data. I'm a lean guy. So the next step is just a side note. There's a thing out there called DevOps. I don't know how many people have actually encountered DevOps. Uh, I think of it as real-time Agile. DevOps is, the, is the, the pursuit of trying to, or actually I'm not even trying to, but really updating software in real time so that 
if you went to bed tonight, and this happens, by the way, for every app that's on your phone, you go to bed one night, the next day, the app is fresh and new, slightly different, new and improved, less bugs. Most of the time, you don't see the improvements, but nonetheless, the idea is to deliver it to you. And again, Google in their beta mode, and even today, uh, as well as Amazon, they're constantly improving their websites. Sometimes you'll see it differently from one hour to the next because they've just released a, a new update for you to see. So the next question is, why is lean? Why, why do we even have lean? So lean evolved. Lean as we know it is a name for a bunch of practices that was done back in the 50s and 60s in Japan. For some reason we needed, we needed to label it. And in a, the United States, that evolution started with the quality movement in the 80s, went through process improvement, then business process improvement as if there's a difference. And then went to re-engineering, which was process transformation and redesign. And now we have Lean and it's uh, kissing cousin Six Sigma. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar for whom this is new, Lean is a focus on waste reduction and Six Sigma on variation reduction. As a practitioner, I have found Six Sigma to be very uh, unapproachable to most of my clients because of its heavy reliance on statistics and large collections of data. Um, but that's not to say it doesn't have value. So why is Lean? Lean evolved. Um, what is Lean? It's a method, right? We use collaborative teams. Uh, we, as I said, systematically focus on elimination of waste and ultimately improve performance. And when appropriate, when mature enough, we can integrate Six Sigma. What does that actually mean, the eight wastes? This is probably a review to everybody on the call. This is a conference focused on lean after all. But just to review, these are what they are. They started as seven, now there's eight, the acronym downtime. Um, but these are all wastes, things that we shouldn't be doing, or even more importantly, that the customer wouldn't pay for if he knew we were doing it. Um, and these are things that inflate our costs and reduce the value we ultimately deliver. Some practical lean concepts. These are similar to what we just saw for Agile. So the practical lean concepts focus on customer satisfaction and the delivery of value. Uh, every project I've ever done with process, back when it was called just-in-time manufacturing to today, focused on what the customer needs and wants and how they want to receive it. Reengineering did it, Lean does it, Six Sigma does it. It's all uh, what I call right to left because customers are always at the end of the process. Lean is often focused on small improvements made frequently. So we see that in many of the, the, uh, the environments that not to say that there aren't workshop models that exist, but they also tend to be focused on solving relatively local problems. They rarely go end to end for an entire process. We see, again, face-to-face -face conversation. The team is a really important construct. We wanna make sure that we attend to metrics and performance excellence and their relationship. Again, quality started with guys by the name of Deming and Joran, and there was a focus on metrics. We have not lost that. Sometimes we lose our way on it, but we haven't really lost it. It's still a concept of lean. Show me the metrics. Let's drive it through the metrics. Um, and projects, like I said, tend to be focused somewhat narrowly. They don't necessarily go end to end from customer triggering event to fulfillment of the customer requirement. Um, and importantly, in, in, in the environment of continuous improvement now for lean projects, so when we got it out there to the shop floor and they're doing the daily huddles and all the things that we've grown so accustomed to seeing out there, the team actually focuses on its own performance as well as the process performance so that it can become more effective. Not everyone can be a good facilitator at a, uh, at a Kanban board. Not everyone can be a good facilitator at a daily huddle board but we need to be able to elevate the capabilities there. Sometimes we change the contents of a huddle board. So everything in the construct in the system that we call lean is open for continuous improvement.
Now, when we think about lean and we think about process management, I'd like to think there's a, vir I first encountered this virtuous cycle when I got trained in re-engineering by Dr. Hammer in the uh, early 90s. And I've adapted it a bit from what he prevent presented. Um, and I, I call it the lean virtuous cycle. You have to start somewhere. So most often when you start the, the lean journey, you will start with determining customer requirements and benchmarking competitors. In other words, you start with metrics and metrics then drive, you, well, the needs drive the metrics that you wanna have. So you wanna understand what your outcome and output measures are as well as your performance measures. Then you go to, well, how big is the performance gap between what the customer wants and what we're able to deliver? I feel for those of you who are following along, I am going clockwise. And we want to understand those big, those gaps and set a goal for what that gap should be. So if it's a 90% gap, maybe we want to go down to 70. If it's a 10% a, a gap, maybe we want to go down to seven tenths of a percent. But that magnitude of change that you're looking to get at then goes into a decision cycle. Is this improvement or is this transformation? And transformation is about 5% of the time characterize it as replacing the process or really overhauling it, rethinking it from fundamentals. In either case, we constantly evaluate results. Now, the question becomes, why would you get into a situation when, and this is not necessarily a question for you folks because you can't talk to me, but why would you get into a situation where you would see a huge gap of performance? And we've lived through some of this. Um, we have a higher demand. We learned something from another industry that we're carrying that expectation to this industry. So because of the way we're able to get fulfillment from an Amazon, and I choose them only because they happen to be good at some of the things they do. Um, and I wish I had been an investor, but they, they can, you can create and have an order confirmation in a matter of seconds. A lot of people are imitating that and needed to totally change the way they did business. Uh, I remember a day when we filled out pieces of paper and put them in the mail and then someone on the other side would actually transcribe it into an order form in a system I never saw. And just the, I, the, the task of placing the order could take a week. And now we've got it down to seconds. So when you learn from other industries, and another example, this comes from a practical example, something that I actually did um, in the insurance industry, we had an idea. This was the, the ATM card was becoming a debit card. That was the era. And the project team I was leading at that point said, how do we get money into the hands of our insured faster? And they said, hey, why don't we create an ID card that's an inactive debit card. And if you had an accident, such as um, a tree falls into your bedroom and you need a hotel room, or a fire and you have no clothes, or your car is totaled and you're 100 miles away from home, how do I get you cash to make those various things go away so you can get back to living your life? And we said, give them a debit card and we will activate it and fund it on a case by case basis. So the fact that people had these things in their wallet and we're used to going and getting cash, um, we said, can we leverage that to be able to give them cash on demand when, when something untoward happened? Uh, it turns out the banks couldn't handle it, but we tried. We came up with the idea. So when we go forward, we wanna talk about what are the things that are gonna transform, or how can we succeed at lean transformation? Let's assume for a second that we have, we're at the virtuous cycle and we see a need for a five-fold increase in speed. So rather than taking four days, it needs to take about six hours, right? That's one context. It needs to be much faster because people are expecting it. So we then get into the discussion of what is lean transformation? It goes by many different names, by many different people. It's called redesign. But basically, it's a process that uses the lean thinking and the lean tools to get a drastically different outcome in terms of the process design. And it starts with documenting your current process. 
It then gets into segregating the actual work activities. Oh, by the way, from a current process standpoint, I think of all processes at only three levels. There's the why level, the strategic level. Why do we do this? We do it to generate these outcomes. There's the what level, which is the big chunks of work, the what we do. And then there's the third level, which is usually as deep as you need to go, which is the how level. And the how level is, uh, is where this action takes place. So you'll typically see this, and there's some examples coming um, as a flow chart uh, that, that talks about how the work gets done and by whom it gets done. But we wanna docu document at that level, we wanted to classify each action into either value-added, business value-added or waste. And a side note on business value-added, business value-added is waste from the customer's perspective but adds value that the business requires. Um, people tend to think of things like audits, some inspections, some reconciliations. And I use the word some there because essentially those are inspections that are non-value added, but we do need to do some to make sure that they don't get errors don't get leaked out to our customers. So we wanna think about business value added as um, the things we need to do to make sure the business succeeds. Value added are the things that we do so that the customer is happy and waste is the stuff we don't want. One of the metaphors I use with my clients is that of a brick wall. The value added are the bricks. The business value added are the more is the mortar, and the waste is what we throw away after the after the wall is standing, which could be forms, it could be supports, it could be a whole bunch of different things. Um, once they are actually identified as value added. We then wanna organize the value added into the appropriate actions and timeframes. And then we wanna realign and add back business value added actions that are essential to getting the job done. And then we attempt to eliminate waste entirely. This is all done in one fell swoop, not through continuous improvement. This is a project orientation. So what does that look like? We start with a process flowchart all things being equal. This is the way work happens. There's a bunch of actions, the hows. You'll notice in the upper left corner here, there's a starting event called the triggering, triggering of the process. At the end, the customer receives the output. Everything in here should be uh, action-oriented, verb-oriented. And um, we have a couple of decisions in there for good measure. And we even have, I think, one error loop going backwards. It's typically what you find in the current state. The st Taking the, the recipe from the prior page, we wind up assessing so the, which items can be uh, eliminated uh, or targeted. The decisions clearly are non-valuated. We don't like decisions, even though some of them are essential. And, uh, and some of the actions are not evaluated. Some of them are business evaluated. Non-valuated are shown with the red uh, diagonal hashing and the, uh, the uh, business value added are uh, the uh, vertical hashing in orange. I can't really tell the difference. And the green, the solid boxes or green boxes, depending upon what you're seeing on your screen, um, those are the value added steps. But then we reform them and we reform them a number of different ways. We can change the sequence. We can merge some of them. We can add inspections or decisions about uh, opportunities into the actual work, error proofing. And this is a perspective on what might wind up at the end. We'll also add at this point that this diagramming is, has been simplified and often, not often, virtually every time I use this approach, I add a line there for automation to capture all the systems that are being used, including Excel spreadsheets. Or I will add an, a swim lane for each of the systems that's being employed if there are multiple. The idea there is to be able to flesh out are the systems doing work that we care about, number one, are we accommodating the systems and doing preparatory work that makes them ineffective, makes us ineffective? So one characteristic that you'll think of there is preparing a, and reconciling a batch in order to be able to process a, a series of transactions. The just in time and quality guy, and he says batch size one. So that's where we how we get from point A to point B. Traditionally, we would take that into a waterfall model and say, okay, 
let's actually sketch that solution of design, obtain all the resources we need, figure out all the actions we need to take, create a really, really big and messy uh, Gantt chart of how we're going to get through it, and hit the start button. And that takes a long time. And there's lots of people involved, lots of handoffs. And it's a big mess. And it doesn't actually react to um, the world in real time because it's slow. It says it's unpredictable because it doesn't have the ability to uh, predict all the risks that may happen. And it's inflexible because once it's started, it's very difficult to change. It's the old steer the Queen Mary metaphor. So let's take a different approach. Let's introduce the concept of a release. A release is a holistic, uh, let's increment of the implementation. So rather than trying to solve the whole enchilada, which is a big bang waterfall approach, let's take meaningful bites out of it. Let's, let's feel like we're enjoying our food as we eat it, right? Um, so a release is, inc is an increment of the implementation. It's holistic in that it thinks about the implementation of the newly designed process from end to end, and it's a substantive step towards achieving it. It needs to add value. It needs to change either the internal operations, customer expectations, or ratchet up the customer expectations, or both. Otherwise, it's not a release. It's a chunk of business value along the way towards realizing our goal. Typically, uh, age, a release will happen in less than nine months or much faster. So it's a way for us to get from one to the other. We know from our lean experience that we can inventory all of our improvements. We can want to use that list and inventory of all the things we want to change to create our chunks. It helps us get from, from where we are to the future state. But we also need to remember as we start this effort that the future state is a moving target. The longer it takes us to get there, the further we're going to miss it if we just stay on a waterfall approach, just nature. Uh, think about major construction projects, um, highway rebuilds, right? The highway is always open to the same congestion they close to because in the interim, traffic has increased. We don't want to do that this work, right? So we end up with this catalog of improvement and everyone probably on the call who's been through a lean project knows the, the, value, uh, uh, the, the value matrix that you come up with at, at the end, the ease of implementation versus the, the value. So that you can have the priority payoff matrix is, one that is the name. And you kind of fill the things in there and you take this quadrant, you do this one first and do these other two. And eventually you get to the stuff that's, that's, that's on the other side. The, the lowest value, the longest to do. But it negates the fact that there's leverage in grouping things together. So one of the things you also want to do is think about how you chunk these up to be these releases that we're talking about. And just a side note, quick hits, we want to do them. They're immediate, almost immediate, usually 30 days or less, definitely not longer than 60 days to implement. Um, they are consistent with your destination. So they help you get some traction, particularly on the change management side of the business. Uh, but they also start to generate value. But they can also be a throwaway, something that gets the ball moving, um, but ultimately is going to get replaced more by a more substantive release down the future. So we really want to make sure that we have these early wins. It's really important from the people side of the equation but it also gives you the opportunity to generate return. And I use the word return in quotes because it gives you the opportunity to generate return that builds momentum or in real terms can actually fund uh, subsequent work. So we wanna be cognizant of that and try and get there. So what does it look like? If we had a project with 16 improvements and we started chunking them into releases, you might wind up with four releases. The more improvements, the more releases, maybe, but rarely will you have 16 releases with 16 improvements. That's the idea. So you affinitize them and you affinitize them so that you understand which ones make sense to be together. Such things as they support one another. Such things as one is dependent on the other. So why not do them as part of one release rather than having people wait for the second one to deliver the value. 
They could be defined as all playing to a particular subprocess. Uh, and here too, an early release might be a temporary throwaway. So in this context, you might see release one being replaced by release four because it re re release four requires custom technology, let's, let's say. Um, the other thing is that the automation changes associated with release are somewhat synchronous. So we're not talking about entire new platforms, but a module that, that will support it. Um, and uh, it should be in the best case, some partial or subset of your ultimate design. And what you want is after you've navigated this from left to right, in this case, the four releases, you have achieved your design. And if each release is about 90, I'm sorry, about nine months or less, then you're here at the end in under three years with having delivered value at each step of the way. Practically, it looks a little like this. So the rectangle represents your, mag, your, your move all the way across and getting through all your releases, however many they have, that's why N. And the easiest way to actually migrate is to create releases that deliver chunks of functionality. Uh, and when I say functionality, it's changes to the way we do the business and changes to the way the customer interacts with the process and changes to the outcomes of the process. And it, in an ideal sense, each release would do that. Uh, that, and you, you say that functionality is going to be the way I break the pieces up and magnitude is going to be the way I release them out to the, to the world. So magnitude are, are things like, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, but it, it's imagined that you would pilot here, a small test environment with one group of customers and then eventually roll it across all your customers. Um, you could, in fact, pilot with a product line and then roll it across a series of product lines that are all part of the same process. You might do it with one supplier and then roll it across. But the key element is here is we do some pilot testing, which is the process as implemented in real time with a subset and then release it out magnitude wise so that all impacted stakeholders actually get the value. And we do that in a somewhat sequential way. Uh, again, dimensions, here's just some ideas about dimensions. It could be employees, it could be employee groups, it could be departments, uh, sub-processes. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can think about it. But the idea is to actually create magnitude differences that, um, that help you roll things out. And so the question is, why releases? Well, I think it's apparent, I hope it's apparent that by breaking things into releases, as with Agile, you will get speed. You will get bigger pieces of change happening faster. And you will actually start to get value, the ability to pay for the downstream work. Uh, it gives you the ability to learn in real time. A little bit more on that when we see it in a Gantt chart look. Um, relearning in real time means that if two, two releases happen to be running in time sequentially or overlapping, that one can advise the other. The other is an early release can advise a release that's two or three iterations down the piece. Because when we get down there, we learn more about the customers and it didn't work as we expected. So we changed some of our underlying assumptions. Uh, and it allows us in releases to re react to outside change. So when we pick that destination, that final design, that's, that's based on what we know today. And as we know more, we kind of have to steer our way through it to get somewhat close, if not nearby. Um, they're all integrated and workable solutions. Again, value continuously delivered. And then this idea of parallelism talks about how we implement. When you break things into releases, they don't need to be sequential. They don't necessarily need to be quasi dependent upon one another. So you have the ability to overlap them a certain amount to deliver value on a regular basis. And that's another agile concept. And I, as I said, pay it forward. If I can get value today, I should be able to deliver it to value tomorrow, for, to pay for value tomorrow. So from a planning options standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. You can actually do things as the top would indicate in a prioritized way. This is the traditional way we do um, lean improvements is we take those improvement opportunities and sometimes we'll group them. But we'll always do them based on, well, this is the biggest payoff and is easiest to do, but this one, all are prioritized and based on dependencies somewhere or another. And eventually we wind up with, in this case, a chunk of the project that takes a year. 
Another approach, which has been advocated for in the past, is to create a, a release race and put them all on the starting line together and see where the chips may fall. Some of the issues with that is you'll notice you've got two releases that are both in this case 30 days long. Again, these are, for example, purposes only, and they're going to deliver at the same time. And I'll tell you, that's a change management nightmare. You have to ask the question why they weren't one release, you know, things like that. And all of a sudden it compresses the time frame. This is now a nine month project, but you also need all these resources up front and they, they kind of fall off over time. I'm gonna say that a ha hybrid approach, a semi-parallel approach that outlines the delivery of the outcomes, this third one, and times them so that they're about 30 to 60 days apart, does two things for you. It spreads your resources out, it does more than two, but two primary things. It spreads your resources out so your project isn't as large, and it also spreads the deliveries out so you know, your stakeholders do not experience what I call a change hangover. Uh, we know the difference between sipping a drink for an hour and drinking four in 20 minutes, right? We don't, four in 20 minutes is, is change hangover. Uh, four in a short period of time would be change hangover, but by spacing them out a couple months apart, it gives people the chance to reorient themselves to, to what's coming next. One last piece even though it didn't show up on anything we've talked about to this point, each release, each pilot in the release is preceded by a lab. A lab is, and sometimes this is referred to as tabletop testing, but a lab's a little more intense than that. A lab is actually a staged event offline that tests things in uh, real time. So I'm going through a project right now with a client and uh, they're going through uh, cutover dress rehearsals. It's a waterfall project, so it hasn't been relevant to our discussion at this point. Um, so they actually do, uh, do a dress rehearsal, which is a lab. Nothing's being changed except they're going through all the motions and they're learning. They've gone through three of them in preparation for their final cutover. The lab is safe. It doesn't impact customers, doesn't impact many employees. It's there to fix things that are currently not perfect. It's there to validate things that we think need to work. And it's meant to be done iteratively until we feel comfortable enough to release a pilot, which is the first time customers and, and, and line employees will see it. And even the pilot is limited, again, focuses on fish and validate so that when we roll out, we can actually measure and continuously improve. And so it's the hidden part of the release. It tends to be the often forgotten part of the release. Many times in the work that I've done, a walkthrough of the process, a tabletop walkthrough is all we get to. When, the, when, the, when there's more money at stake, so to speak, when there's more on the line, I definitely think a lab is gonna add more value for you. <sighs> That's a lot. And I'm on time. It's time for questions. Great, thank you so much, Scott. That was really, really informational. Let me just make sure I'm spotlighted here. So feel free everyone to add some questions into the Q&A. We have a few here for you, Scott. Yeah. So when wanting to approach work using an agile or release-oriented model, uh, it can be a difficult sell to executives. They want a date and full account of deliverables. Any advice on how to manage that? Um, probably the best way to manage it is to put your, your cost benefit analysis at the release level and treat them as, inter going back to what I, what I hope I said, a release is meant to deliver interim value. So it's a minus, it's a minimum, uh, a small part of the ultimate that you're getting to, towards. So in and of itself, it should self substantiate itself. You should be able to do a cost benefit analysis on each release. In certain instances, the market will change vastly enough that you'd stop after your fourth or fifth release. There's no need to go further because it's no longer a viable target for us. Strategic change happens whether we want it to or not. 
um, it, you know, we're, we're all living right now through the, 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 the repercussions of COVID, which no one ex anticipated. Some of the projects I'm sure somewhere that were started pre-COVID are no longer relevant in a post-COVID world and need to be abandoned. Now, if it's a waterfall project, it's a lot of waste under the, uh, under, over, the, over the waterfall. But if it was a release-based project, you would have gotten value out of, it, out of those first two. So I would actually advocate for, for um, convincing the management team that each release is a standalone prop value proposition. Great. Um, we have a question here, another yes. one. Can you clarify, does the lab phase involve limited stakeholders, perhaps a smaller number of limited stakeholders than during the pilot phase? Or is it typically internally only? It's a great question. Um, and the answer is typical for a consultant, yes. Uh, <laughs> no, the reason I, I, I mean, yeah, or it depends. But it, it, ideally, ideally, a transformation project involves external stakeholders. It's great when you do this. When, when we were doing the work on claims that I mentioned briefly, um, we actually had. Um, some of our insureds in the lab to see what was going on and see if it made sense to them because it was it was actually for them you know and and also by the way in that particular model we had five sub processes defined and we implemented one sub process which was a cha total change in our phone operation from message takers and schedulers to actual um, actual under non underwriters so claims adjusters so that they can resolve the claim on the phone call with you. That was one of the ways we got the process to work faster. So the, 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 um, the, the I'm sorry, Jessica, can you repeat the question? I lost my train of thought. Uh, sorry, I moved it over into another session or another section. Okay. Um, does the lab phase involve limited stakeholders? Yes, perhaps? Okay. Thank you. So, so, all parts of a lean transformation should can invite all forms of stakeholders to them. The lab is typically, think of a, of a, of a black box theater production. You're actually acting it out in real time for an audience of critical designers and stakeholders. You're getting feedback at that point. So I, I neglected to say that, but the audience should be some key stakeholders, some customers, definitely the people who have designed the work but it should not be done by the people who designed the work. It should be done by employees who are ultimately gonna be doing the work. Okay, thank you. Here's a question I actually was a bit curious about myself. Yeah. How do you minimize scope creep in releases and set criteria for what should be done in those releases? Um, write a good charter is probably the only, it, it, that's true for all projects. It, if, you, if you write a charter that says, this is what we're intending to do, um, because it's a subset of the improvements you've already identified, you now have a, you have a list of the things you're intending to do. So if you write a really tight charter and you have good reviews, the other part is because they're relatively short, there's not a lot of opportunity for scope creep. So a release should be no longer than nine months in duration. It's typically three to six. Okay. Let me, so we've got a few more minutes here. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to integrating the agile approach into non-software development efforts? efforts? Um, sometimes it tends to be viewed for software implementation as opposed to other improvement or transformation efforts? Sure. Um, well, I'd like to think that the approach that I presented for transformation is a non-technology approach to using Agile. Um, you could, in fact, slice your releases to be smaller and smaller, but in the world of process and people change, you're getting into a more risky place of not being able to keep up with the uh, the uh, the uh, schedule of, uh, of your sprints. So the difference between a release and a sprint is, is a little more liberal with the timeframes and it's variable, but there's nothing that says that you can't break a release down into sprints. 
particularly if there's technology to write in the change as well, you may desire to do that. Uh, so we've, we've now created very small projects that can be sliced up yet finer if it makes sense with regard to technology. Uh, good trans the transformations sometimes require technology and sometimes don't. And when they do, I would advocate that we would use an agile approach to the technology development. Okay. Um, we have a question around if you've had uh, if you've had any successful approaches into embedding EDI or equity measures into the work. Um, honestly, I I can't answer to have, I haven't had the experience of needing to, so I can't. I can't provide any of that. The, the only thing I will say is from a personal standpoint of being exposed to EDI, it goes to how you construct your teams to do work, not just for this sort of project. And I've always advocated a form of equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, that's not necessarily the current political or, or definition of the word, but one of the things I always say to my clients is, we want people who are cross tenure so that they've been with the company for a very varied number of years. We want them cross organizational so that they've come from the various different departments that might be part of the process. We also want them to be cross hierarchical. So we have some people that are higher up and lower in the organization. And you can easily add to that, we want to, uh, we want to represent more genders. We want to add, represent more, uh, different races and ethnicities. Uh, and and the, the one I heard today was that, that the EDI or DEI add the concept of respect to the, to the thing so that when they're in these teams, they are treated as equals. Everyone's idea is, is as important as the next and everyone is, has their hands on the rope. So I think that this lends itself to integrating EDI or DEI into it but I've never had the, my own experience to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question around, say you're at the end of a project, uh, in the planning phase of a project, and you've already outlined and delivered some of the milestones. How do you step into the middle of that project about to implement and apply some of these tools? So do you have any tips for kind of coming in at the middle and Ooh. wanting to to uh, adopt this more agile approach? I'd have to give that a little more thought than Q&A. So whomever asked that question, I left my contact information. <laughs> I'd love to have that discussion. No, I, this is more from, a, from an academic standpoint because I'd love to be able to bounce off more of the particulars of what you're dealing with to be able to come up with a, an answer that's depending of your circumstance. Great. Um, let me see here. Um, a couple, oh, we have a quick question here. Is the term lab another term for UAT? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, that's an unequivocal no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> lab is a place where stakeholders come to view something that might be. UAT is a place where people come to see what is and accept it or decline it. And they're very different. One is more of a collaborative constructive process and the other is a yes or no. And they come at very different times. Okay. Well, I think that is all the time we have for questions. Yeah, oh, I, get, have I, have, I have a closing slide. Oh, so, my apologies. So that's okay. I just want to take it away. People, I want to leave people with a brief summary. So to review, right? We talked yeah, about we, four different approaches to, to actually implementing transformation. Our traditional waterfall approach, agile, lean continuous improvement model and lean transformational model. And thinking about them on seven common uh, characteristics about overall scope and when they tend to be, uh, how fast they are, what their focus is, what their payoffs, or when you see their payoffs, uh, what value they actually deliver, what, how they complete, or what their dri driving is for completion, what their structure looks like, so when you see it on that paper, and what the ultimate goal is, 
this is a summary of everything I think I just shared with you. So we see things, and actually there's a couple of things here I want to highlight that are in question mark. So the payoff for Agile being frequent, not borne out by data at this point, I would hope that each time a sprint is done and functionality is released, it's considered valuable, but I don't know that that's the case. Um, one of the things about the lean transformation is we try and stay away from infrastructure type releases of just building something to build on. Um, and then the, the traditional one talks about a large amount of value, but the question for me there is, is that value delivered at a time frame that it still has value? So like I said, it, to me, some of these things were unclear. This is my take on what I think I presented. It's a maybe a flip chart or single page re reference tool for you guys to look back into the details of the presentation. And with that, I really appreciate your attention today. I appreciate the great questions and I appreciate having even been invited to participate from Results Washington. I hope you all had a good time. Great, thank you so much, Scott. A lot of great information that you provided today. I wanna to thank all of you for attending. Uh, the conference has just started. We're just wrapping up day two. So visit our website uh, where you can sign up for additional sessions. Um, and remember, um, as we close here today, a survey, a really quick three question survey will pop up. We'd love if you would provide both Scott and our team feedback so that we can continue to improve uh, the conference that we provide. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone.